You are now listening to Out of the Blank. 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 Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Matt. How's it going, guys? You okay? <laughs> His name's Matt, and Matt has a story to tell, and the stories, they always end mysterious. Am I right? Um, yeah. I mean, I run a podcast called uh, called Crack and Cove, and it's the podcast that shines a beacon onto the bazaar. And the general setup is that me and my younger brother, we live in a lighthouse. We're like lighthouse keepers, as you can see from the beard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we tell stuff i'll tell stories to him that's the way i kind of do it because it's it's something i've been doing ever since i was a kid i'd be sort of uh reading stories when we were little and you know we just kind of grew up enjoying stories of the weird and the wonderful you know wait so you live in a lighthouse we pretend to live in a lighthouse <laughs> i was about to say i always wondered like when you buy the lighthouse or you live in a lighthouse does that mean you have to be the one that always has to light it and make sure like that beacon's going or is it like you can like rent the place and then some dude has the actual job title that has to do the lighthouse keeper because that has to have some training onto it right like i don't see that being like oh you bought the house guess what now you're the lighthouse keeper you're like well, well i don't even know how to turn the thing on it's like well figure it out and if you don't ships are gonna crash <laughs> I, I think i think they're all automated now i think that's what it is they're all on an automated thing um but uh that's what i've always wanted to stay in a lighthouse i've always wanted to well i've always wanted to live in a lighthouse and, uh, being in the uk uh, we've got more than our fair share of lighthouses we've got sort of hundreds of them and um you you're never far you're not more than 80 miles away from a lighthouse really i've been to one lighthouse and it had the most steps i had ever seen in my entire life and i was like this is fucking tasking imagine if like you lived in a lighthouse for instance you got your tv on the bottom floor but then one night you're like oh i gotta light the beacon you run all the way up the steps a 15 minute haul all the way up to the top and you leave the remote up there and you get all the way back down sit down in the couch and you're like Where's my TV remote? Oh, I left it on top of the lighthouse. So you have to climb all the way back up. At that point, you're just sticking with whatever's on TV. Yeah, but I just think how fit you get. Can you imagine what your calves would be like? Those big thighs. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, like a Stairmaster. It's, yeah, it's living inside a Stairmaster. That sounds fucking awful. <laughs> 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 yeah, but the, the idea of what we're doing is uh, we just love the idea of anything to do with the paranormal. We like anything to do with things like um, um, monsters or sort of folklore or things like this. And even just weird news, just looking into weird news. That's what we like to do. We'll get, I'll, I'll talk, spend my week looking through the papers and looking on the Internet and seeing what's what, looking for interesting stories. And then when it gets to recording time, I record them with my brother. Uh, uh, and uh, do a bit of editing and we get them out on a Friday. That's how the uh, Crack and Co podcast sort of goes, really. What do you find out of everything that you could, if I, like, let's say, if I was going to ask you, what's one mystery, what's one scary, whatever creepy thing that you want to know the answer if it is real or isn't, what would that be? Oh, that's really good. You see, I do have a couple, but the mystery that got me first of all was actually one called the Flannan Islands lighthouse mystery uh, and we've recorded a special on this we've got a double episode on it and what happened was the uh, it was about 19 1900 maybe a little bit earlier and the on the mainland they noticed that the uh, the lighthouse the light wasn't being lit they realized that the light had gone out and so eventually they had to send a supply ship over in treacherous seas to get across the lighthouse and when they arrived there all three lighthouse keepers had disappeared without a trace the oil skins and the wet weather was uh, was missing but one guy's coat his heavy coat was still on the hook it was a tidy a well looked after lighthouse station and no sign has ever been found of what happened to these three men and i'd love to know the answer to that love to know it i heard a similar story about like a, the weirdest thing is like how people like how can somebody like there's these missing files or cold case reports where it's like, well, the mystery's just unsolved. And I'm like, well, 
did you just give up? I understand the time maybe to find a missing person. There's a time limit there. And eventually you're just looking for a body. But when you're coming across like a murder case file, why is it that it's never been solved? Like you got one sitting, this has been sitting here since 1922. It's like, well, why the fuck hasn't anybody dived into it? It's like, nobody wants to pick it up. I'm like, we definitely need to hire someone to dive into that. There's a topic called ghost ship. A bunch of people seeing like ships in the night. Well, there's also another story account of a, I think it was uh, a grandfather and then like his son and his son's friend. They were all like older age, but they all went on a ship from off the coast of Australia and they went sailing. First of all, never go sailing unless you actually have sailing experience because you're gone. You're dead. That's just the, that's just a goodbye. Well, they, they found the ship, but none of the guys were on it. And there was everything, drinks, cards. They were playing, I guess, a game of like um, Texas Hold'em or something down in the side of the sail ship. There was a gun even on the table, but there's nobody to be found and no shots fired. So they don't know if it was a struggle, if they fell off the boat and everyone's wondering what it is. The theory I think is a lot of where they were kind of like going on the coastline, they were going from Australia. They kind of like taking a little trip down like near the coast of Africa and everything like that. That's where that's where pirates are, like legit drug pirates. So I think they might have saw something that they shouldn't have seen, and the guys just hopped on the boat and took them. But everyone's like, it's a fucking mysterious thing. They could have got because they went near the Bermuda Triangle. It's like, what the fuck? What is happening? Are you just bringing out every example possible to say that they might have just disappeared magically? That's an answer I want to know. I don't like that stuff where it's like, you could definitely find the answer if people put more time and effort into trying to figure out what the hell it was. I, I believe there's some things like, for example, things like a, like a better term, ghost ships, like the Marie Celeste. That was a classic one of the style that you're talking about, where people, all the crew was gone, everybody disappeared, and they don't know why. But these, these stranger mysteries, I mean, there's a mystery locally to us where a man went missing, just a standard family man, really, you know, looked after his family, and uh, he, was, he was just a really steady guy. He disappeared for days and they eventually found his body. His body was on top of a coal, coal pile was for, for, for um, steam trains. But there was no footsteps taking to the top of this high coal pile. It was like 50 feet high was this coal pile. His clothing was inside out and his body had somehow been steam cleaned. And they don't know how he got on top of this coal pile. And any evidence was nothing to say. People say it's a great evidence for like alien abduction and his body had been put, put there. But... I mean, really? And there's no answer. And I don't think there ever will be an answer. Why would a clothing need to be inside out? Why would it need to be steam cleaned, you know? And I just find it amazing. Maybe he's a neat freak. <laughs> you just had a really hot shower. <laughs> Usually you have to pay for something like that. Like get to pay extra. Like I want you to steam clean the inside. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, I, I think what I, for me, you seem to be the kind of guy who wants the answers, whereas I relish the idea that sometimes life doesn't have any answers. Sometimes the weird is just there. It just happens. It just, there isn't always an answer for everything. I think that it's important not to always have the answer because then it, it, it takes the mystery or the fun out of it. I think that's why religion is so much fun is because you don't have a definitive answer until you are gone. And then you don't know what's there. It's always this answer that's left unseen. It's based on faith. That's why I really appreciate that because it gives something for people to want to believe in towards. And it gives this kind of miracle or magic. Why I love cryptid so much because even though there's evidence based on this, 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 and this, you don't really know because you've never seen it. And unless you've seen it yourself, you're not really truly going to believe it. So I love that idea, but some shit I'm like, you hear an answer to something and the next thing you know, it's 10 years later, it's exposed as information is like, oh, that was inaccurate. Actually, this is how it is. Like one of the biggest mysteries that was like a huge mind screw to me was um, for ages, the men, the whole idea of a, a child being born was a sperm goes after the embryo and then, you know, whatever, uh, Oh, what's, what's that word? I would say, I wouldn't say germinate because we're not germs, but you know, it, it I'd go with that. Let's do it. Sounds, it, it fertilizes, <laughs> it fer fertilizes yeah. the egg. So what they thought was it was always the fastest sperm that got to the egg, which was the way that that's, that's who you are. You are the fastest sperm and out of everything that got shot out, not true anymore. 
it turns out that they d- they've done studies and found that the egg releases a certain pheromone that slows down the other non-specific genetically, I guess, fixed sperm. So it actually chooses the perfect sperm. So not maybe there was another one just like you, but he had uh, instead of I don't know needing glasses or something he had the ability to be really good at talking or i don't know being able to play poker well something that's a little bit of a different trait but the egg could sense that and he's like i don't want that one so the egg actually picks the sperm so it's not the fastest and then i'm like that's a fucking mystery i'm glad i have the answer to because that is magical as hell (laughs) he's so strange and the idea that um i suppose there's a lot of uh, genetic compatibility is probably selecting uh, things which that the egg is most compatible with too. So for example, you know, there's less chance of having a miscarriage, perhaps less chance of having a deformity, perhaps even if the fastest sperm was, you know, the fastest sperm should have got there, that might not, that might have some flaw in its character. You know, that's the sort of, that, that might be the thing. Maybe that's the detection. Or the biggest mystery of how is it that even though you are personally different from your parents, you still have genetic code inside of your body that links from all over your heritage from way, way back in the past. Things that you'll be able to pull out and be able to do that someone's like, that's from your great grandfather or that's from this and that. And if any little bit of that genetic code could be modified by one little number, one little digit, you're fucking completely different. That's a mystery I want to know. I want to know that and black holes. What the hell is in a black hole? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's like your genetic sequence. Maybe that's where you get in there. You'll get in a black hole and you'll suddenly find group strings of numbers and all your sort of DNA secrets all in there. You know? I'm literally looking <laughs> for it. It's, it's like the scene from the cartoons where they're like just in a giant white background and it's just them floating in nothing. I'm like, that's what, like, there's got to be a way, something that you do, like jumping up two times, ducking down four times, spinning backwards three times, like a, se- a secret cheat code in life that just sends you there and you're like oh shit i just broke the system what do i do you just get yourself whether you find yourself the easter egg there you know yeah <laughs> and what's so what you like have you got a uh, have you got either a local cryptid or a favorite cryptid something that you can uh, you can sort of share with me that i can look at i am probably closest to the uh mothman the virginia mothman oh yes absolutely fun that's my favorite that's that's, my favorite that one's so overblown though no offense to you but it's like everyone loves that one and i'm like let's i want one that's not as known you know bigfoot even is all known nessie is all known what's one that's not all known i want one that's like nobody's really ever heard of because then i can root for the underdog and watch him like succeed when he becomes like actually real like holy shit we found a beaver with four heads i'm like yes we did we found a beaver with four heads (laughs) Well, we we had a we had one locally, just maybe a quarter of a mile from my house here, and uh, a woman who was driving down the main road about two o'clock in the morning, and she suddenly got a feeling of all you know, absolute terror came over her about maybe half a mile away, and it started to grow and grow and grow this feeling of terror, and as she got near to where I live, she said she saw on the side of the road to the left this huge black mass almost shaggy looking but was just so black you couldn't see into it and it was there on the side of the road just giving this immense evil vibe and as she put her foot down and went past and she looked in a rear view mirror she saw this huge mass step out into the road and watch as she went past no explanation what it was and I, I interviewed her for the one of our Halloween podcasts I went across and found her and she is absolutely adamant her story has not changed over the years no idea what it was and totally unclassified just this immense black figure which was she said it was about something like about eight feet high but six feet across at the shoulders bigfoot mm, do you think a bigfoot sort of yeah yeah I, look, I i've <laughs> stuck up for bigfoot plenty of times in this podcast on the aspect of like i don't th- I think it's weird that a bunch of people who don't know each other, who don't have the access or capability to the internet to send an email or even a text are able in two different places in the world, be able to recount the same exact description of a similar like beast. I look at that like maybe it's a race of hominids, but it's, 
it's hard. Maybe he's interdimensional. You know what I mean? I always kind of bring up that point. Like maybe you need to take drugs to see him. Like, cause you know, <laughs> native Americans, they always like to think of um, animal spirit guides. So maybe if you take enough peyote, it's a reason why a bunch of people can see the same exact thing is because you're all literally hallucinating on the same drug. And you're so connected from like an, I guess, a like a, 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 such a level that's like when you're in the room with somebody and you get into a conversation, for instance, you guys hit the same yeah. frequency. So maybe these people just got tuned into the same frequency and it affected their drug trip and they saw the same shit. Well, you're talking about sort of that kind of thing. It could be a way that you access these other places. Uh, and this is the theory that me and Ben have is that uh, the Irish believe that these, what they refer to as the thin places. So it's the areas in the world or perhaps even in our minds where the connection between perhaps what could be different realms it is kind of got thin and these beings creatures entities are somehow maybe getting through that way you know you're getting maybe getting a glimpse as opposed to actually seeing the full thing and this is why there's no sort of bigfoot skeletons and why there's no in the uk there's no big cat skeletons maybe this is a creature that's sort of just pushed through from another place and then sort of slipped back what do you think to that I think that's possible. I think that if there is something like that, I think it's maybe that not that these creatures exist, but maybe the fact of our creativity willing it into existence, such as like when you hit that place, that thin place, maybe you're creating it like you're in a dream. You know what I mean? Like it's literally casting out this thing being because tulpas are created through a bunch of people believing in those things. And it creates like a ghost, it, like you're literally willing it into the universe. But any monster you've ever seen, like if I showed you a picture of a werewolf, you're going to say, you know what that looks like? It looks like a mix of a bear and a wolf because our minds cannot create new things. Our minds, faces, anything you've seen in a dream, those are all created because they're taking bits and pieces of information that we've used that we come across in our everyday life and putting it together into something. It's how a werewolf was created. It's how Bigfoot was created. It's because you've seen that thing before. We, as people, our minds cannot create new things like that. We just take bits and pieces of something else and turn it into something. So what? how does that explain aliens what the fuck did we put together to make aliens i don't know my mind just goes off i'm like everything seems like there's that thin layer of like it could be true but then there's just this large portion of it that's like it's probably not yeah I, i'd agree with that I, I think you make a really good point especially about our minds sort of snatching bits from here there and everywhere and putting them all together because in uh, in british history in, uh, in uh, we always have a like we have like a, a strong tradition of weird animals but they're always things like a cockatrice or a chimera and um, these are always creatures which are made up of things like the uh, or a griffin it's got the body of a lion it's got the head of an eagle it's got the talons of a so or it's got the tail of a, of a snake it's always as you quite rightly as you said there it's always making things up from lots of other things within our minds but again as you say an alien the concept of this being with a weird look about it i don't know i'm not too sure there really that's that is a, it's a good question perhaps it could be uh, this is what we've been doing all our lives and it's like angels things like this they're all all that same part of our minds going to making gods angels aliens that's all that side of things I think I've become more of an alien believer during this year alone on 2020, just on the fact of like, I think when they released unidentified flying objects were real, we were all kind of like, okay, we don't really care because we're dealing with something right now. So it was a perfect time to do that. But then you saw the monoliths popping up everywhere and it really brings into question like, oh my God, maybe we're a test species maybe a superior alien race or something went and saw four different planets went to each planet and dropped off a little bit of bacteria next thing you know that bacteria after thousands and thousands and thousands and hundreds and thousands of years evolved and now we are who we are today and we're the one species that seems to be the most fascinating at the same time the most destructive and that's them putting up the monoliths like hey we're about to acupuncture your whole planet like we're about to find the weakest points and this is where we're going to attack well, it's the uh, it's almost like the star seeding um, idea is that, isn't it? Where any sort of life has been sort of come from somewhere else or been purposefully, as you say, injected into the into the earth. 
Uh, and I'm kind of a little bit inclined to somehow believe that because it seems a little bit more plausible than even just life just starting on its own. It's, you know, just life just beginning seems almost insane. It doesn't seem possible. I, I'm not a religious person. I don't, uh, I don't necessarily believe in a, 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 a God. But then again, that God might have been a supreme being who came down and began life on Earth. Who I think it's a little bit more, it's definitely an interesting theory. Well, look how if you have, let's say, let's give you uh, your own place, okay? So you're at your own place, you're living in the lighthouse, and you're like, I want to get a pet for my lighthouse. So you go and you get a bunch of hermit crabs. If you've ever had hermit crabs, they're just sitting in a tank and they don't do a whole lot. But at night, they start moving around. And when I had hermit crabs, one of them climbed the little palm tree that I put in the tank as a decoration and got out of his cage. I found him on the floor. I had to pick him back up and put him back in there. And then I put up, then I fixed it. I put a grate over the little hermit crab tank. He did the same thing and then broke through the grate and got out. And then we lost him and I couldn't find him again. Maybe every time we go into outer space and we get farther and farther, the aliens are like, hey, man. It's getting to the point where we actually need to focus this. It's a controlled substance, like a controlled species of pet releasing and going farther out of its grasp than you initially thought it would go. And maybe that's their whole idea. See, these are all possible theories. They don't sound super, super, super ridiculous if you just have an open mind to it. But the issue is, is like we are so fascinated with so many things that can't be explained, but we're not even looking into the giant mystery that is pretty explainable if you really start to research heavily into it. The human mind, that thing is so fucking crazy. We talked about um, imagining things, willing it into the universe. Imagine back in the past, the people that were drawing hydras, the people that were, where did that come from? Where are you seeing that? How do you get the giant snake with nine heads? Where is that coming from? You had to see something in your life that brought that up into your mind. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, but that, as you quite rightly say as well, though, uh, uh, the idea that of us being like the hermit crabs, I just love the fact you've kept hermit crabs, by the way. I think that's absolutely brilliant. But um, the, those those crabs getting out of the tank, that's really what Arthur C. Clarke's story, which he based, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey was based on. It was the idea that we went across to another planet, I think, I believe it was either Mars or wherever, and we found a monolith on that planet, and we tinkered with the monolith but what it was it was an early warning system to say they've got out of the tank they've got this far they're now space capable better come back and sort them out better come back and put a grill on on earth kind of thing so yeah it's comparable isn't it i think the idea that a lot of people have that we're the supreme species and there's nothing else out there like no other alien race, it's not real, it's not no such thing. I think that is a dumb way of thinking because I think we should always be prepared that something is probably bigger and faster than us. I, I, th I think that's totally true. And I, I am also a firm believer this year that various governments are kind of pre preparing us for this. We, we, we've, we've been given a little bit of information here and there. We've been told... There is life in the uh, in the uh, skies. In is it Venus? I believe they found sort of organic chemicals in Venus in the clouds of Venus, and and the Ross obviously the government said, well, yeah, we have got flying uh, flying saucer UFO footage. We've got all this sort of thing. I think they're just generally easing us towards the idea that they they do have knowledge that something that they're aware of that we're not yet. They're just getting us close to it, and then they're just going to kind of give us a quick reveal. Oh, by the way. We've been in touch with aliens for the last sort of 37 years or something, you know. I think it's probably the fact like they've been trying to show us for a long time with media and, and movies and stuff. And the reason why aliens and all the movies are so different is in case we do ever come across an alien, we're ready for anything. We're not just thinking small little green men. We could be picturing anything, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, what would you, if you had to imagine in your head, what do you think aliens look like? What's your, what's your image when you all think of them? I'd like the picture, the one like from the movie Paul. I like, I think that definition of an alien is, <laughs> yeah. is probably spot on. Yeah, I, I, I've always been uh, the Whitley Strieber kind of um, communion book cover. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You know, the big black almond eyes. And yeah. I always think they're going to look a bit creepy. I think it's going to, they're going to creep us out. Obviously, the one that a lot of people really hope for is the tall Amazonian woman one. But um, I don't think that's going to happen, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think we we'll can really only hope. The... We can only hope. <laughs>
I think we're just going to get the creepy spindly alien sort of uh, shoving probes in his butts and things like that, you know? <laughs> I mean, if we really wanted to find out a really good mystery that I really hope is true, I would love to find out. We know about giant squids, but I want to know about the Kraken. That's that's yeah, the, that's, that's the, the one. That's the main thing for me. That's like when I when I saw the name of your podcast, like please let me tell tell me they're talking about the Kraken because like you see it all the time in Pirates of the Caribbean or movies or something. I'm like that has to be possible that there's a giant species of fish that is like a colossal in size. Like we're not, you know, we're not like the biggest, the baddest around here. There's obviously things we know about giant sloths. We know about those things used to exist back then. Well, what about a giant squid? And it's weird because that can be actually alive today because the fact that the ocean, because of the, I guess, the view of sunlight, I would say, time is different underwater. So I don't know if you understand. Yeah. I don't know if you know a whole lot about this. But, I, but the there- thing is, as well, the, the- go ahead. These um, the the thing that they do have with the giant squid is that they've got an idea of how big they can get, an idea, and that's the way they get the uh, main concept of this is the size of the bee through the sperm whale, because that's the only thing that can't be digested by the sperm whale as it eats the giant squid. Now the issue they've got as well is they know how big the suckers are on the giant squid because of the uh, sucker marks. Or again, on the side of uh, the uh, the sperm whale as it's gone into attack, they have found sucker marks on the sides of some sperm whale, which far outstrip anything we can even conceive of for the size of what we know as we're got, we're talking ten times bigger, something like that. So there's a potential there that you that might be our kraken. It might be the idea that this creature, this vast leviathan, is down there. And it's, as you say, very old, very slow moving because of that time is different underwater. And it could be just kind of waiting in the uh, in the deeps to sort of like rise up and uh, maybe even just pull down the sperm whale, you know. I definitely think if there's a Kraken, there's got to only be one. I believe it's like the alpha, like the one that controls all the other ones, kind of like everyone knows like, oh, shit, that's the daddy. Like you don't mess with the daddy. Wow, I, I like that idea. I think there's, I think there's at least there's a, there's a film in this. I think. This... <laughs> well, look, I mean, bees, for instance, the bee, the the queen bee, she literally is the she's the queen of the hive. Everyone is in cater to her, but if she senses that there's other possible queens in the hive, she will sort them out and kill them. So if she can sense that there's another gene or something, so why can't krakens do that? If you can sense that there's another like giant squid that could be a possible next kraken or someone that could fight for your throne, you're going to fucking annihilate it. Well, the issue they have with uh, both squid and octopus is that they're actually very short-lived creatures, even for the size of the short-lived creatures. But pound for pound, or, or the, for the rage, they're in intel- incredibly high they have huge intelligence and i think the theory is that if a uh, a cephalopod of this sort did live long enough the intelligence could accrue will far outstrip us because they can become incredibly intelligent within a few months whereas if they would allow time to actually grow and get bigger and become more um uh, uh, like i say more intelligent then uh, where would they be? That'd be the alpha creature on Earth. Maybe the Titanic didn't go down because of an iceberg. Maybe it was a Kraken. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine that tendril coming up and just scooping it down? It would be. It would have been a better fucking <laughs> movie it. to I watch. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true. This is true. Yeah, I think so as well. Have you um? It, so if you could find the solve the mystery of any creature, would it be the Kraken? Is there any others that you think uh, you really kind of get your interest? Mm, it would probably be the Kraken or I would like to know more about Mothman only because it's so popularly known. And it to me, that seems like the one that's the most bullshit. Well, I think the thing is as well is, uh, in fact, it was it was it next last week, maybe a week ago, we did do a story on another uh, on the uh, a different type of the Mothman or an Owlman creature, uh, and 
the, the, the facts are that these, they're seeing these all over the place and the actual sightings are becoming more. Why would anyone imagine this? Why would this just be conjured up as a fever dream? It seems that people are seeing something out there and they're kind of um, not in connection with each other. They're just sort of witnessing something bizarre. Do you read comic books? Um, uh, I used to a lot of years ago. Okay, anymore. if you look at any of those superheroes, that's something that could easily have been a fucking cryptid. Like, the thing? Are you serious? Like, that's what the Mothman is. He's just some dude's creativity of wanting to draw a superhero, and he turned it into a, somehow got it into like a mythos, I would say, which is freaking nuts. I think that's good. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, the, it's, it, maybe it, maybe this imagined, as you say, like a tulpa almost. Once imagined, they don't go back in the box. Maybe that's what it is. Because the Mothman, the idea of it has come out sort of fairly closely in conjunction with the whole boom in the comic book as it is. The flying man of great power, even an evil villain, you could argue. Um, and it's maybe it's a creation that sort of hit, touched the nerve of, of the... the the whole of the world and everybody's kind of just the pinging up all over the place and seeing them everywhere now. The crazy line is how that can be so washed up because of the fact of if somebody creates a cryptid or creates a folklore or something, then someone else keeps doing their different spin or their different interpretation of what they're hearing. Next thing you know, you got the Mothman like they do in Fallout where it's like a giant bug-eyed creature with like eight different legs and it's nothing like you would see with the Mothman legend. And I'm like, now this thing is never going to be found out to be true because we're creating so many different depictions of it. You go, well, I did all this and the Mothman isn't real. Well, you didn't look in his lair. I didn't even know he had a lair. Well, in this legend, he has a lair. It's like, all right, now we got to check the lair. It's never going to end. <laughs> Checking the Mothman's lair. <laughs> I do like that. I do like it. <laughs> yeah, cheers. <laughs> there's, there's too much in the complication of cryptids and too many mysteries out there. I'm like, let's stop creating new ones and let's try and solve the ones we have because that's the fun part is trying to solve it. I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I mean, one thing that hasn't been solved that I was really interested in is the um, the guy who the jetpack guy at LAX, you know, who's been sort of flying around disturbing the uh, the air traffic. Have you seen this? No. Oh. No, this is basically uh, um, at Los Angeles Airport. There, the uh, the pilots have been coming in the land. Next thing you know, you've got a guy in a jetpack with the plates <laughs> as they're coming in the land. And he's, they can't seem to find him, they can't catch him. The, the, the police have looked into it, they've got footage of the guy flying, just can't seem to put a finger on it. So who's this guy, you know? Is it Elon Musk out for a spin, you know? <laughs> but just a guy in a jetpack. Ah, oh, man. No, no. I don't like this because now I'm thinking that somebody from the future coming back to the past. Well... Oh, that's a good one. That is good. You know, these you do see these uh, old kind of like uh, um, like old cinema shots from sort of like 1902, you know, where you see people walking around real fast in black and white. And then you sort of see some of the guy then suddenly sort of like talk on a phone and kind of move off. And you think, is that a time traveler? Okay. And a, very, uh, a, ver a, very, a very famous case was in uh, an England high street, just in, in an ordinary street in an ordinary town in about 1890. Multiple witnesses saw a, a disc appear, a metal disc appear, and it was maybe sort of 20 or 30 feet off the floor, but it had a handrail all the way around the disc, and people were stood on this disc as it hovered along, and just they would, the people on the disc were just observing, almost like you'd go to the zoo, you know, they're just sort of like going along like they're on safari, they just it just appeared, and they were observing the disc. And eventually the disc just disappeared and everyone was left like, what the hell was that thing? But it's quite a, quite a well-known case, is that one. Mm. I'm trying to think. Because I just had something really, really good in my head I was going to say. On the future aspect of things. Because that were time travelers. It was a time traveling kind of uh, incident. That's what, the, that's what the thought it was. They did think that uh, these this 
this device, this craft had come from the future and was observing them. And it was uh, it was quite a big, big thing at the time. That was what the, it went along at the same time as the, the phantom airship scares that went along in America. You know, again, silver craft appeared from nowhere and seemed to be observing the people of the planet. And they thought, wow, it's, uh, it's not aliens. They thought it's people from the future. What about the biggest kind of conspiracy slash mystery on the aspect of the men in black literally there have been multiple accounts of a black cadillac pulling up to a man in a old black style suit and just getting in the car but people would recount seeing these men that had shaved noses shaved eyebrows shaved lips look like their whole face had been completely burned there was no distinctive facial features to be recognized by anything is that real? Because there used to be an old video game that used to basically it was like a quest. You would play the game and it would give you a, lo- a choice of uh, different options to choose. And each different choice had a different outcome. And it would be a basis of like kind of like a census test or a personality test to see if you were a good person or a bad person. There was an old video game machine that some people remember and some people don't. Some people say it never existed. And some people say, I remember that in the arcade machine, but it was only in, in the arcades for like four years in like the fifties. So I'm like, is that a thing for the men in black? Is that, what is that? Like, why is it that we know the government to be secretive? What's to say how how far off is it to say that there's not a bunch of people out there that are designed to basically hunt aliens or find alien life or find these things and keep the public away from it? I'd be more inclined with the men in black. Um, it seems as if rather than working for the government, there seems to be almost like a separate agency on their own somehow, if, if that's sort of that's the case. They seem to be seen more... More, not sent by the government themselves to sort of like keep tabs on what's going on or it seems to be almost like they're a different agency I and mean, if they are real the men in black is it a case that they're aliens themselves monitoring who's visiting our planet like good aliens trying to keep the bad ones away oh bad aliens trying to keep the good ones away uh, i think if they were bad aliens though we'd probably all be enslaved right now <laughs> hey, maybe because <laughs> I look at it like I think definitely because there's obviously there's uh, the Center for Existential Risk, which was appointed by Reagan, and it's basically five people that are involved in this observatory that monitors alien life, They're basically checking to see if there's any extraterrestrial life out there that could end up harming Earth. Who's to say that it? there aren't people out there like the men in black trying to stop aliens or trying to stop people from being aware of this type of thing. I just look at it like who fucked up this year and didn't cover up the monoliths who did not zap enough people to get rid of the monoliths. Yeah. Yeah. I must admit we've been covering the monoliths an awful lot with all of them. And we even saw the, uh, the gingerbread monolith uh, at Christmas. And uh, that was in uh, San Francisco. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. The only thing I didn't think was cool about that was that um, somebody was seen licking it. That's just like the human race. Everyone on here, like our first thought is, what happens if I lick that? And then the second one is, what happens if I stuck my dick in that? (laughs) (laughs) That is the most human thing going. That is the most human sort of a a, a reaction to anything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i would like to know is um i've been checking out that you've done 51 episodes i believe yeah of this podcast that's good going that's good going um what drove you to start doing that i don't know i just felt like posting one every day and then now it's became so tasking i'm probably gonna stop doing that <laughs> I think it's a good idea on yourself. It's it's because it, I know I I started doing uh, maybe two podcasts a week because um, I ran another one. You see, I don't do another one called uh, the Lucifer Tapes, and I've not I had to stop doing that for a while because it's just been too hard work. You know, because Crack and Cove takes a lot of editing and working on. And it's got a lot of research as well. But um, the idea of somebody said to me now that you've got to do Crack and Cove one a day every day, uh, I think I'd throw myself off a bridge. 
<laughs> What's all the Lucifer tapes? Um, well, what it was with that is uh, I used to work in the print industry, uh, and that's what I used to be. I used to be a full-time printer, and I did that for 30 years, and I hated the job, just absolutely hated it. And while I was there, uh, I had an awful lot of spare time on my hands, and I started uh, writing and, uh, under the pseudonym of General Lucifer, which was a bit of a strange one. It was actually the name of a French bicycle manufacturer that I took the name of. And um, I just liked the name, it sounded pretty cool. So I started writing and uh, I wrote about the people I work with who assholes, just morons who kept doing stupid things all the time. But the writings became more and more kind of well-known and eventually became a book called uh, Pantone Blues, uh, available on Amazon. <laughs> and um, from those stories, because they're not quite short stories, they're all sort of between say, say 300 and 1,000 words long. Um, I've started there's nearly 300 stories so I've started record podcast form uh, and I started so there's only there's only about 16 to 17 episodes out there so far um, but each one's a little self-contained story about an incident that happened with the maniacs who I used to work with but um, when the pandemic started uh, I realized they got what was called key worker status at the print print factory and i was one of the only people still working i just thought i'm not going to sit here in a print factory that um uh, working doing the work for everybody else so I, I took voluntary redundancy this year so I, I, I was made redundant um but from there uh, i am now in the brewing industry I, I now brew beer that's what my uh, that's what my job is now. dude you look so, like you would live in a lighthouse out, okay you look like you would live in a lighthouse and you look like you brew beer that's perfect <laughs> well that's that's the thing it is it's a sort of certainly an aesthetic <laughs> but the uh but the brewing side of things it's, it's a great great way of working it's a, it's a great job um a brewery is called horseworth brewery and i'm in a little town called horseworth that's where i am in the world uh, in the north of england and this guy is just set up his own brewery from nothing uh he needed a hand uh i was available and that's what we do now we brew beer and uh and get it out there and sell it it's great it's a great way to earn a living but on the side of that of course i've got and uh, other little creative projects i do as well how about say so do you incorporate cracking cove with the beer brewing mm, well actually uh one of the first things we don't nothing to do with cracking cove yet but the the lucifer um side of things i did i used to do live stand-up uh, performances the stories read the stories out and the brewery has uh has been one of the, like a hosted one of my live and they're a good laugh you know where everyone's just solid there's plenty of beer uh, and it's a lot of comedy so it's it's yeah it's really good really good fun is that but perhaps a crack and cove brew could be a good idea we'll have to get myself uh i don't know what i don't know what main ingredients i have to put into that to make it especially uh uh a, a podcast Maybe I can see if we can get some giant squid and maybe get that in there some way, you know. Just put make a butterscotch beer. A butterscotch beer. Wow. Where 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 where, where, where do you get the idea of that? Because you would just be like, then you would say, "Crack and Cove butterscotch beer. It's bittersweet," and then you would fucking end it on that. Oh, there you go. That's all you need. <laughs> Once you go into brewing, you've got the uh, you've got the right idea, you know. <laughs> now I'm trying to think of like a good lighthouse. But, um, ships ahoy and then it's fucking tastes like shards of glass from broken ships yeah that well, was that a, could good be a good one, one. Could be, like well one. the thing is as well i suppose if we if we if, if we <laughs> if we uh, if we oak aged barrels you see we could use them in oak aged barrels that may be from the uh, the wreckages of uh, ships that have come to ground on the uh, on the cove you know you can taste like the that. tears of leonardo <laughs> dicaprio when he was drowning on that titanic <laughs> just call it leonardo those tears <laughs> oh my god it's perfect <laughs> oh no <laughs> it is it's good stuff <laughs> matt dude I so think... as far as like uh, any monsters go on no uh, go ahead what were you saying I was going to say, uh, have you have you actually seen anything yourself? Have you have you witnessed a anything strange? Have you uh, personally seen anything? 
maybe after watching the X Files when I was like six years old and thinking I was seeing a monster in my room, sure, but no, I haven't seen anything clear evidence that there's might be something real. Would you like to? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Well, I hope you do. I hope you get to see something. You fucking said cool. that, and it lined me up like you had a monster to show me. I was like, yeah, I do want to see one. <laughs> well, I have not seen a monster, but I have met my own um, doppelganger. Who is your doppelganger? I'm, I'm curious. Well, what it was... Um, I used to go drinking around the uh, around the city called Bradford. We used to have a, like a lot of rock clubs. And before I had all this, I used to have long hair and I, I used to go to, like a lot of rock clubs and things. And people started coming up to me and saying, hey, I saw you the other day and you acted really weird. You know, you, you didn't act like you. You acted like you didn't recognize me. And I said, I didn't see you. It wasn't me. And it happened to get more and more and more frequently that people were saying, hey, look, I came up to you the other day and I was talking to you and you just pretended, you just blanked me. And I found this really, really strange. So what happened was um, a good friend of mine who I worked with, I'd worked with him for 10 years, he left the place where I was working. And he said to me, he gave me a ring and he says, you're not gonna believe this, but this new print works that I've gone to. There's a guy here, identical to you, he's doing the same job He's the same age as you. He looks like you. He's got the same hair as you. Um, he's just identical to you in every way. He's left-handed as well, just like you are. Uh, and and I, I couldn't get my head around this. This was so weird. And anyway, he, the, the sightings of him was becoming more and more frequent. And then one night I was in a, in, a, in a rock club in Bradford and a friend of mine just came running up and says, he's here. Your doppelganger is here. And... Um, and I kind of walked around and I saw this guy and at first I thought, well, he doesn't really look like me. And then he just turned and he was exactly the same as me. It was my face. And I kind of approached him and he looked at me and he did like a double take and his face just lit up in the most friendly face. He was just sort of going, hey, how are you doing? You all right? Like he recognized me. And this is the first time I'd seen him. I says to weird, this is so bizarre. And he, and he looked puzzled and he says, um, what's weird? I said, we look the same. We've got the same face. And he just became furious, absolutely furious. And he sat screaming and telling me, fuck off, fuck you, fuck you. And he stormed away. And after that one incident, nobody saw him again. He was never sighted around town. Nobody, none of my friends had sort of said, oh, we've seen him again. He said something. No, he disappeared. Do you ever think maybe that was you from the past or the future? Well, I sometimes wonder because what they do say about um, uh, doppelgangers is that they're almost like a spirit, like a like some sort of spirit creature. But if you challenge them, or as in you call them out, it breaks the spell. I didn't know this, but by me saying, hey, you look just like me to him, that was it. It broke the spell. Done. And that was it. Never seen again. And I can't explain that guy. I can't explain him. All I know is there was, for a good while there, there was an, an identical person to me. And he was gone. Oh, my God. It's possible. I wish my future self would give me, like, the Powerball numbers or something. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Damn it, Matt. That's a really good... That's a, yeah, that's you know. a that's a great encounter. Holy crap, man. Imagine me coming across someone that looks exactly you like, like that me. One. Yeah, that's freaking nuts. <laughs> well, shall I leave you on that one? Yeah, that was, dude, that, that that already has my mind blown. I'm already thinking like I'm I'm picturing you at a concert and next thing you know you're talking to some guy who looks exactly like you. Then he gets all aggressive at you for saying, "Hey, you know we look similar." Unless he knew you personally and was like, "That dude's an asshole. Why would you say I look like him?" You know what I mean? Yeah, that's it. It's because the only thing I can think of is I called him out. Called him out and that were it. Done. It's perfect, Matt. Let everybody know where they can find uh, uh, your podcast, where they can find you on Instagram, Twitter, anywhere. 
Well, uh, yeah, you can get, get well, just go on to the uh, Facebook, uh, Spotify, you can go on to uh, Instagram, uh, on Crack and Cove Pod, uh, on Twitter, we're at Crack and Cove. Um, just go into your Apple or Spotify or anything and just type Crack and Cove in, you'll find our podcast there. Um, download and have a listen to it, it'd be great. And I just want to thank you very much as well there, Robbie. It's been great talking to you on your Out of the Blank podcast. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.